I'm going to talk about uh, VPN. So VPN is for virtual private networks. And we are going to, to see how we can create VPN on, the, on a network, a provider network, and how we can use the same technique, in fact, to carry uh, private addresses, like layer 3 VPN, or to interconnect, uh, to bridge two network using an IP network. And also, how we can use this technique to do transition between IPv4 and IPv6. So that will be the main part. And uh, when you will be in REN, you will have some, uh, we will continue some exercise on this VPN. Okay? So, what we are, are going to see is VPN. So, what is important to notice is that now we have separated the core network from the rest of the world. So that's something that it is very important to notice that when you have your, your network, you have your PE routers that are to inter interact with the rest of the world. So this one has to be uh, aware of the rest of the world. But what we want to do is to isolate P routers from uh, knowing everything about the rest of the world. So P routers in the architecture we want to develop will only be aware of what happened inside your domain. So the goal of a P router is just to put connectivity between edges. So there is one very easy way to do it, one very intuitive way. Is for example here, I we are going to see that in, in more detail, but just to give you an overview. Here I have an IPv6 network. And here I have a core network in IPv4. And I don't want to change my core network because P router are very expensive because they are forwarding packets at a very, very uh, high rate. Uh, and so if I, uh, I don't want to, to change them. Here, P is not so difficult because P can handle my IPv6 traffic. So they have to talk IPv6 here. And here, they can continue to talk IPv4. So the main idea is, for example, here I have a prefix alpha 6, which is an IPv6 prefix. So I will learn it using IPv6. So here with eBGP. So a very simple way to do things is then I am here opening a connection using IPv4. I will put TCP and then BGP. So here, you see it's on IPv4. I will carry BGP and on BGP, I will carry the IPv6 prefix alpha 6. So when this message will cross P router, we will have no problem because here we are just forwarding IPv4 packets. So my IGP that run inside doesn't know anything about the rest of the world, just know about root inside my domain. And it's a good thing because this IGP allow me to have connectivity between my PI. My IP. Okay, so here I receive an announcement in IPv6, and here my BGP router here is like a proxy, and it takes the announcement and change the transport protocol and put it into IPv4. 
The request arrive, arrived here. So what will I have here? This router has also to know IPv6. And this one will have is BGP rib that will know that there is a prefix alpha 6 and the next stop is this address. So the next stop will be the IPv4 address of this router. Okay? It's what we saw yesterday about next stop. You, when you send an announcement, you put your IP address on it. Here, it is not changed by P router because P router just forward the packet. So here I will have as a next stop the P address of the router that sends the announcement in my network. So what does it mean here? It means that now I have this next stop and I can do something very easy. When I receive a packet to alpha 6, one solution could be, is not the best solution, but could be to create a tunnel. So this tunnel, tunnel will be from uh, PE to next stop, PE. So this is an IPv4 header. And here, I will put my IPv6 packet. So here, what happened? I don't, this router will not know about IPv6 because they will just carry an IPv4 packet to this PE. So, what I have done, I have isolate inside network because inside network is V4 with a very limited view because it only know the database only know internal prefix and you don't have other things. And my PE here know about external routes. Here in the example in IPv6, I will carry IPv6 and then I will send it on a tunnel. But it can be also, if I look at the same example, it can be IPv4. And here I have the three, uh, uh, 350,000 entries regarding IPv4. So here, and I will map them to another PE, and then I will send it to, send it to a PE. So it means that here I don't have to inject my 350,000 routes inside my network. So that's interesting because I reduce the load of my IGP. And it's easier for me to, to manage the, this kind of network. So that's one of magic of, of BGP. Just here I do pure BGP, an interconnection with BGP and a little piece of IGP inside my network, but that's all. And what, but it's not very efficient because we are using tunnels, but if I was using MPLS, it will be much more efficient. And since I use this kind of tunnel, I can do a lot of things. For example, I can do, so we see that we can do IPv4 here, public IPv4 outside, and here I have my internal router, and just by using public IPv4, I reduce the number of entries in my P router. But I can also do private IPv4. Because if I was using private addresses here, I can carry in a tunnel, and this way, I can carry them inside my network. So I can interconnect to a network of a company that is using private network, private addresses. So, I am a provider, and I go, for example, to see Pemex. Pemex say, I am using private addressing in my network, and you say, don't worry, I can interconnect your different company without any problem. And if you see a bank, a bank say, I am using a private network, 
you will say, okay, no problem. I can also carry your traffic. And I guarantee you that I will totally isolate your traffic using private addresses from Pimex, even if both companies use the same private prefixes. So that's one good interest because as a provider, you can also allow some company to use your network, to your infrastructure, to interconnect their different sites. So this is what is currently due um, in IPv4, but you can also use, as I show you in the example, to carry, for example, IPv6 on an IPv4 network, or to carry IPv4 on an IPv6 core. So we have all the, the possibilities. So we, we are going to, to see all, all these things. Now, we have a definition, so I will focus mainly on L3 VPN. So what do we call L3 VPN? It's VPN where you are doing routing. It means that you interconnect, for example, You interconnect a site, so you, are your, you have your provider network here, and you guarantee that you interconnect companies using private addresses, let's say 10 slash 8. So you can have this company that use this addressing plan, and you can interconnect them. And here, you have another company that use the same addressing plan, and you guarantee that you will isolate the traffic. And here the inter agreement you will have is a router. So you are routing traffic from this element to this element through the provider network. So this is done at level 3. That's why we call L3 VPN. You have a, another group that is called L2 VPN. And when you do L2 VPN, you don't care about what you are doing here. We have a bridge. You have a bridge here, and you can bridge your traffic between two uh, sites of the company you interconnect. So here, it can be viewed as a link, for example, at layer 3. So the advantage of doing layer 2 VPN, it's that you don't make any hypothesis on the, traf on the layer 3. So for example, if I do L2 VPN, I can carry easily IPv6 on it. If I was doing IPv6 here on the L3 VPN, it means that this equipment will have to understand IPv6. If I do an L2 VPN, we don't have to understand it because we just carry Ethernet frame from one point to another. So that's the, the interest of this. So we have more flexibility, but of course you may have more traffic. So what we can do with L2 VPN is, for example, to interconnect what we saw in the first day of class. It means that here you can have your metropolitan area network. So you remember we can create a very huge layer 2 network using a provider a by, um, a backboard bridge. And for example, you have a school here. So we saw that it was possible. So you put Mac in Mac here and you interconnect to this provider bridge, and then you take the frame and you can send it, for example, to another metropolitan network. So here you have scalability. It's, we have no scalability, as we say, but we increase the non-scalability uh, factor. So it means that we can, we can have a huge network here, but still non-scalable. And then we use this, which is more L2 VPN, which is more scalable, and then we can inter interconnect on other metropolitan area network. 
So this way you can interconnect two cities together and create a layer two network between two uh, companies. And this resource is a shared resource. It means that different companies can do the same thing using here in the middle the same infrastructure, but you guarantee isolation between this infrastructure or this traffic. So this is something useful. In linear to VPN, you have also the possibility to emulate a link. So not see it as a packet and just bridging packet, but you can emulate, for example, SDH link with the guarantee of service you have when you are doing, uh, you are using SGS, SDH network. So it can be on an IP network, high speed, very high speed IP network, but this way you can, for example, emulate a two uh, megabit per second link with something, a traffic very similar to what you will have with SDH or with a, a, a piece of copper. So this way you can emulate even the copper. The last kind of a VPN is what we call L1 VPN or GMP, uh, GMPLS, Generalized MPLS, and it's something totally different. In that case, what you do is you have optical fiber between optical switches. And you remember, with MPLS, we open what we call an LSP, Label Switches Path. And it was to create a context, a switching matrix that says that when I receive something with a label, then I will send it on another label. And the goal of all the protocol we saw was to create this path of label. Here, in fact, what we are going to do is to open a physical circuit between two points. So instead of here with MPLS controlling the switch of labels, so something done in electronic, here we can switch lambdas. It means that here I have, uh, um, I have an, uh, a color that is used to send traffic, and I say, when I arrive at that switch, I go to another color on that fiber, and then another color on that fiber, and then another color on that fiber, and then I open an optical circuit from one point to another. And then I can use it to send at, for example, 2.5 gigabit per second some information. So, of course, on a color, you will have a very high bandwidth. It's not 2 or 3 megabit per second. It's more in terms of gigabit. But, for example, you, you have a network. So you have, of course, some colors in your optical fiber that are used for IP networks, but maybe you may have some dark colors that are not used to carry your IP traffic. But for some experiment, you allow some people to create their own link to exchange traffic at a very high speed without any interference with the IP traffic. So this way, it is possible to use GMPLS, so you see that it's very similar in a way so to what, what we are doing in, in MPLS, but instead of switching per frame, we are switching, uh, we are here sw switching the colors the optical, in the optical fiber, and this way we can create a path, and then we, we, we use that path. So I will not detail these kind of things, I will focus more in that class on L3 VPN. And when you will be in REN, we will also make some exercise on L2 VPN. Yes? That's a good question. Uh, I think both of them, all of them, are good for real-time application. It depends then how 
what kind of contract you have you, with your provider. Because here, so I told you that we have PE here. You have your uh, network, your, pro, your customer that give you traffic. It can be L2 or L3 VPN. And then here, what you will do is to establish uh, LSP in the middle of your network to carry your packets. So now, it will depend on the way you create your LSP. If you are using LDP, what we saw uh, during the it's what we saw during the, the class. So if you are using uh, L LDP, so it's just based, based on your IGP, and so you have no guarantees. Just to do at layer two and half what we were doing at layer three. But if instead you are using LSVPTE, so LSVPT will be is a protocol that allow you to say I want this LSP to go on this 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 and this router. So instead of using a path selected by the network, as a provider, as a manager of this network, you will force the traffic on a certain uh, path. And you can add redundancies, means that if this path fails, then you have plan a backup uh, path to uh, cover a failure. And here, you can also reserve resources. So you can say, for example, on, on that path, I have 20 megabit per second that are reserved, and I'm sure that my customer will be able to use it. So if you create your LSP in that way, then you may uh, adapt to some real-time constraint. And if you are doing L2 VP, uh, L1 VPN, then you have all the bandwidth of uh, uh, color and fiber to send traffic. But in that case, of course, it will be a huge uh, bandwidth on for application is not the case. So if you have some constraint, then you can do that. And when I talk about uh, a possibility to emulate a wire when you do L2 VPN, so in that case, you will lose a, use a lot of traffic engineering techniques inside your core network to guarantee the bandwidth, guarantee the jitter, to avoid too much uh, variation in the delay. That is, lead, that is done with uh, when you are doing packets. So, when you will be in REN, you will have a class on how to use RSVPTE with MPLS. So, I don't go into details here. So, that's uh, the different VPN. So, here we are going to see, I think it's the easiest way to understand it, because we have two families of protocol, and now we are going to formalize what we have seen uh, with tunnel in the first example. So here we have, you are managing this network, so composed of four planes, so BGP plane, your routing information base that is used by your IGP, so OSPF or IS2AS, your FIB that is used to forward packets, and we introduce also MPLS, and MPLS will create LSP and so label switched path, which derive from things that comes from your FIB. So I don't go again into the detail. We saw that yesterday, or um, I don't remember if it was yesterday or on Monday, when I show you that with LDP you exchange the label you propose, and then you, you have a way, you, you know from your shorted path tree where you want to send the traffic, and you select appropriate label, and you create your lib. OK? 
Okay? So, here, well, what is the problem? You are a provider and you have an IPv4 network. And so you, you are happy because all your customers use IPv4. And one day, you have one customer or one or two customers in your network that say, okay, we like to do IPv6. And it's very boring to, to do IPv6 for you because you say, okay, I will have to change all my devices. So uh, I will say no to this customer because it's not, the market is not uh, really mature and uh, the cost will be very high to, to change everything. So in fact, you don't have to change everything. You just have to buy two, in this example, two new PE, provider edge router, for these customers. So you can, if you have another PE, only IPv4 customers, so you have nothing to change. So here you just have to, to buy new PE that will, will be dual stack. So they will talk IPv6 in that way, with IPv6 customer using MPBGP, multi-protocol BGP, and they will talk IPv4 inside your network. So it's what we saw just before. So router R1 has prefix alpha 6 on its network. So it will send a BGP. So here you open MPBGP protocol to announce here. But there is a prefix which is called alpha 6. And the next stop is R1. So in which family of protocol is R1? Hmm? It's IP, no, it's eBGP, yes, for BGP, but this address is, is IPv4 or IPv6? So this is an IPv6 address, because here we just know IPv6. Here, on the other uh, side, uh, from R3 to R4, we have also open a BGP connection, multi-protocol BGP, we have an external BGP session here, and we will be able, when we will learn IPv6 prefixed, to inform R4. So, what do I do next? Is to send an IBGP, internal BGP packet, on my network. This internal BGP packet will be on IPv4, as I said before, because R2 and R3 is dual stack, so they can talk IPv4 inside the network. My IGP made the connection between, made possible the connection between R2 and R3 using IPv4. So I send a message here, and my message will be a little bit different of what we saw before. In fact, I will put here alpha 6, which is the prefix I learned, but I will also put a label, MPLS label. So that's why I cannot call, remember I told you uh, when we saw BGP that I will call prefix NLRI, Network Layer Reachability Information. It's because here it's not only a prefix, but it's a prefix plus a label. So my NLRI is alpha 6 and a label for MPLS 60. And then I put the next stop. And here I have a problem because the law, the law is BGP, says that the next stop must be on the same family as the prefix. So it's written in uh, RFC that describe BGP, MPBGP, and say that we must have the same family. So it's not really a problem because here I have an IPv4 address. So R24 is the IPv4 address of R2. But I can transform this into an IPv6 address. I have 32-bit in IPv4. 
128 in IPv6, so I can move easily uh, from one uh, family to the other. So what do I do? I use a special address called uh, mapped address, where you have colon colon, so everything equal to zero, FF, FF, and then your IPv4 address. So that's a strange address. Why do people uh, select that? It's because, in fact, SFSF is neutral when I am doing a checksum. So in IPv4 and IPv6, when you are doing a checksum, what do you do? Is you take all the world of 16 bit and you sum them to get a result. If this result is higher than 16 bit, you take the bit extra bit and you add them, etc., until you get a number on 16 bit. So this is called the complementary to one sum of all the address. And what you can see <coughs> you, is that FFFF is not all. It means that if I add FFFF to a result, I will have the same result. For example, uh, let's take an a very simple example in uh, decimal. I have value 1, 2, 3, uh, 4. I have value 1, 2, 3, 4, and I want to make the sum in complement to 10, to 9. So what does it, I will do? It's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. So how much I will have? 1 plus 2, 3, plus uh, 3, 6, plus 10, plus 4, 10. So here I want the result in one digit, so I do 0 plus 1, and I got 1. So the result is this, 1. Now if I add 9, so 1 plus 9 equal 10. So I had 1 plus 0 equal 1. So I have the same result. Okay? So here is the same thing. When I am adding FFF, it's the maximum number I can have in the number of digits that have been assigned to me. And when I do the sum, it will be not wrong. I will get the same sum. So, what is it? so why is it very interesting to have this? It's because if I have a TCP packet, a TCP message, you know that the TCP message has a checksum, and that checksum is based on something at layer 3, which is mainly the IP address at layer 3. So, if I have IPv4 address, I will have this. Uh, I will have just IPv4. If I have IPv6, either, I will have a packet with these addresses. And I will have the same result. You can tell me that it will be, it will be easier just to take IPv4 and a lot of zeros. It's also checksum not for. But this is, was already taken by other mechanism, so instead they use this one. So it's what we call map address, and they are defined for uh, IPv6 to IPv4 transition. So here, I will not use this uh, checksum property, but it's just an easy way to carry an IPv4 address into an IPv4, IPv6 address. And the standard this way is happy because alpha 6 and 
next dot are from the same family. So let's arrive here to R3. And what do I do with R3? If I make a table that say when I want to reach alpha 6, I will have to send it to the next stop, with, which is R, the IPv4 address of R2. And I will have to use label 60. So now what do I do? I receive a packet from R4, and this packet from R4 has the uh, alpha 6 as a destination or address that is in the alpha 6 prefix. So what do I do first? I look at my BGP routing table and I say that to reach alpha 6, I have to send it to this IPv4 address. R2, IPv4 address of R2. So I look into my MPLS table, my FEC forwarding equivalence class, that says that to, to join the prefix of R2, I have to use label 123. So I send a packet here using MPLS. Let's say, for example, I use label 123. I arrive on the, uh, this switch here, and it says that here I have to change to label uh, 456. Yes, I forgot to tell you here what I have done is that I have stuck two labels. First is label 123, which is a label to reach R2 for a VIP for address of R2. And then I put label 60. Label 60 was given to me by R2, and it was associated to alpha 6. So I send the packet. The packet arrived. To, so it switched to R2, and here I arrive in the penalty arm router, and this router, of course, share the same prefix as R2, because these two routers are on the same link. So they will have the same prefix. So here I succeed, because with this label 123 at the entrance, I arrive to the prefix R2. So here I will have a pop, and I will remove the first label. Okay? So the only label that remains, it's the second one, is 60. And then R2 will receive a packet with label 60. So R2 will know that it received something for IPv6 because it, has, it, has, it assigned 60 to an IPv6 address. So after that, he can, for example, remove the label 60 and send what you have after to your IPv6 entity. Because remember, I remember you that we don't have in MPLS a field that gives you the, uh, the type of the upper layer. So here the type is quite dynamic. It's just because you assign to a label a certain prefix. And six, you say 60 is, at the, for this moment, IPv6. So you know that you have to send it to IPv6. So it's local convention for R2. And so this way, I arrive here, and I send, send my, I forward my packet to R1. So what is the moral of this, this story? Is that here, I have forwarded IPv4 packet to allow the signaling message to go from R2 to R3. So here I use IPv4, but I carry IPv6 information. And when I am carrying IPv6 traffic, I don't go to IPv4. So it means that this router in the middle, this P router, so either in one way IPv4 traffic, and they are used to carry IPv4 traffic, or in the other way, MPLS traffic, and when you are doing IPv, uh, MPLS, you don't go to the IP layer. You stay under. So it means that here I don't have to change these devices. They work as usual 
And they didn't know that they were carrying something with IPv6. So that's something that is very useful and is used in a lot of networks. For example, France Telecom is currently planning its migration from IPv4 to IPv6 and is using this technique inside their network to carry IPv6 traffic. So it's a very good solution. And the Chinese have developed another protocol. So there is another group. So this solution is called 6PE. You understand why? It's uh, 6 for IPv6 and PE for provider edge because you just have to change your provider edge and you have nothing to change every year every, uh, at other places. Uh, it works well. So it's something that allows you to move easily to, to IPv6 and have very good performances. So, I like this solution. It was, for a certain period of time, my favorite exam because the draft is very, very short, but you have all the network class in uh, three pages of internet draft. So that's, uh, that's perfect for a student to, to have such, so many information concentrated in, in few pages. But here, you see, it's more for all the Europe. It means that you have already a big IP for infrastructure, and you want to uh, smoothly introduce IPv6 into your network. Another solution is developed by a working group at the ITF. It's called Softwire. So Softwire is doing the opposite. It means that you have IPv4 at the edge and IPv6 in the core. So, for example, in China, they develop the biggest IPv6 network on, uh, on Earth that cover all China. So, China are very Chinese people are very proud about their network because it's the widest in the world. But as the other they have the same problem, is that you have, they have no traffic. So most of the traffic is IPv4, and we have very, very few IPv6 traffic. So one idea is to use this IPv6 infrastructure to interconnect IPv4 groups or companies. So of course, I will not go in, into the same details, because here, compared to 6PE, what do you have to do? Is just to exchange IPv4 and IPv6 in my ex explanation. So here I have something in IPv6 in the middle between R2 and R3. And I have IPv4 between R1 and R2 and R3 and R4. So R2 and R3 are PE elements. They are double stack, but in the opposite. So here, I send a BGP message, alpha 4, to my next stop in IPv4, R2. And here, what do I do? I send alpha 4 on a label, and then I send the next stop, and here I will put the IPv6 address of R2. And here, the problem is not technical. But I am breaking the law because I told you that the prefix on the next stop should have been of the same family. And here the prefix is IPv4 and the next stop in IP is IPv6. And it's much more complex to put 128 bit into 32 bit. It doesn't enter that, way, uh, that well as we put 32 bit in 128. So what can we do in that situation? No, in fact, it's a stupid question because, in fact, what people did is to change the law and remove this stupid constraint to have the prefix different, prefix family different from the next stop family, They're equal to the next stop family. So here you see that the law 
but has been written in RFC 4760. The network layer protocol associated with the next stop address, uh, the next network address of the next stop is identified by combinations, AFI, SAFI, carried in the attribute. And now, what we can say is that they, defla, they declare new AFI, SAFI to allow to have, for example, NRLI, so the prefix in IPv4, and next header in IPv6. So this has been changed, and now you have a new RFC that allows you to do that. So it just is not a technical problem, it was just a standardization problem. But now, if you want, you can, you're a new provider, you may say, okay, I am moving all my network to IPv6, and I will interconnect people in IPv4. And if you are a new, really new provider, for example, in Asia, you will be obliged to do that. Because in Asia, there is no more, or next week, we will no have no more available IPv4 addresses. So new provider will not be able to start a business with IPv4. They will have to start their business in IPv6. An IPv6 address, IPv4 address, become more and more rare, and you know, uh, you are in a business school here, so you know that everything that is rare is expensive. So, for example, Microsoft last uh, month bought some uh, IPv4 address from Nortel, and I, uh, if my memory is good, the cost was $11 per address. So, they need addresses, if they find some available resources, then they will put the price to get them, to continue to run IPv4. So, if you want to buy addresses for your customer, you want to put these addresses to your customers. You don't want to put this address into your network. So here, to put IPv6, IPv4 address here, is a waste of money. So by doing that, you create your infrastructure in IPv6, and IPv4 is just for the customers. So it's a way also to surprise. Of course, here, it means that your P routers are IPv6 only. So now it's the case. If you are a new provider, you can buy P router that carry, carry of course, a dual stack, and you will only activate IPv6. But if you are an old uh, net, uh, provider, you have invest on some equipment that maybe are not able to carry IPv6 traffic. So that's why you have your uh, solution. So, but you see here that we have um, a possibility now to put IPv4 and IPv6 on the same element, and it's uh, totally transparent. We are going to, to see something that is not quite new. Because in the first uh, exercise we made on last uh, first day, we had the same problem with the library. You remember? You had, we had the library that was using private uh, addresses, and they wanted to interconnect to the internet. So here, you have two libraries which are competitors' library. So they don't want to, of course, that the other access to the other one resources. So how will you do to solve that problem? So you are running the Orange library on our bookshop, and another group is running the Blue uh, bookshop. So one solution is to use tunnels. So what does it mean, a tunnel? It means that on your router, you will create a new interface. So you have your IP interface, for example, Ethernet 0. Okay. And this Ethernet, uh, this Ethernet 0 has a public address, okay? IPv4 address, 
which is given to your provider. So normally here, what you will do normally is that you put a NAT for common usage, you put a NAT and then here, when people are using private addresses, then you put uh, this NAT. I have to write on that time. So, here, what will I do is to create what I will call a tunnel. And a tunnel which says that instead of going on, on a NAT, a NAT translation, to put everything under a single address, so it means that for a NAT, I have an IP packet with private address as a source address. I go through the NAT, and through the NAT, I will change my packet, and instead, I will have my source address here, my IPv4 public address, and then I will leave. So this is one solution, because here I will have only one header, and I change in the header some fields. So this is good, because I, with this kind of thing, I can talk to any computer on Earth that has a public address. But as we saw, the problem is that it's very difficult to, come to initiate something new that come here because we don't have a context. And so, it's difficult to inter interconnect my things in my company network. So, what can we do is here, I have still my packet with a private address. So what can I say it's to do is to create what I call a tunnel. And say, for example, so I will call it, for example, tunnel with zero. And say, create a routing table inside my router. And say, for example, that packet toward 10.0.3.24 are sent to tunnel zero. And here I will configure my tunnel to say, in fact, you put that in a packet to the destination and it will be the public address of site, let's say, site three here. So the, if you look at this site, you have a public address and you use this public address. So here, what will be, um, for example, for default port, I will continue to use the NAT. So here it means that when I want, I am in the library, a range library 10.0.1, I want to go to Google to find something, then I will go with a NAT and I will, my address will be translated to a public address, and I will. When I want to go to library 10.1.3, then my routing table say, okay, use tunnel zero, and I will have, in fact, encapsulation of two IPv4 packets, one with private address 10.0.1 to 10.0.3. Sorry, on, on the other end. So here we have my private address 10.0.1.x to 10.0.3.x, and it will be in a tunnel. So here we have the IPv4 address of my site, and here the IPv4 address of the destination site. Okay, so here, one possibility is to create three tunnels. One with 10.0.3, one with 10.0.4, and one with 10.0.2. If I know the public address of this element, then I have just to create four tunnels, or three tunnels, and put them 
into my routing table. If I want to reach something on 10.0.2, then I use the public address of this site. So, this is one topology, and of course, every site can do the same. So here you see that everybody can talk with everybody. And we have absolutely no risk that my traffic go, will go to a blue site. Because I use public address that are assigned to my uh, range site, and so the traffic will never go to a blue site. Here, no. In this example, I don't use any ciphering tool. But it's a possibility, for example, to put here an IPsec header and cipher the content. An IPsec will contain an index and this index will help the receiver to find how to decipher this information. So I, I can do it. Here it was not, when I do IP over IP, I don't cipher. But if I'm using IPsec, then in that case, I will cipher. So this is one solution. But is it the, what do you think about this topology? For example, I, I create a new arrange bookshop here. So what do we have to what do we have to do? Yes. So the problem here, for example, is that when I create a new library or bookshop, then I will have to create a link on all the routers. And I will have to, uh, to configure all the routers. So for my site, it can be easy to do, because it's a new library, so I have to set up four tunnels. But I have also to set up this tunnel in the four other routers. So when I, am, I have only a few libraries, it's a good thing. And I can also have a look at the traffic. For example, the site 10.0.1.24 is the main site. I have all the information here. And in fact, the other library are just getting information from the main site. So creating, for example, a tunnel between 3 and 4 is not a good solution because it's not very important because I have very few traffic between these two uh, sites. And this is... Uh, and here, of course, I, I, I have hidden totally the topology of the network. So what looks very simple here on the direct link, in fact, in my topology, for example, here I am, uh, let's say, in, um, in, in Cancun, and here I am in Oaxaca, <laughs> for example. Uh, here, I may think I have a direct link between these two cities. <coughs> but in fact, my provider network is, some, is around Mexico. And so I will send my packet to Mexico, and then my packet will go to Oaxaca. Or, for example, if you could take uh, Merida and Cancun, you look like a direct link here. But in fact, you will have to go to a central point in your network. So it will not be so direct. So direct, if you look at the physical topology of the green network. So that's, and when we'll be in the rain, we will talk about IPv6 trans, uh, uh, integration. Um, at the beginning, for example, here, if you say that it's IPv6, and the green one is IPv4, it was the first infrastructure we had to carry IPv6 traffic, so to create tunnels, because there was no router element that were able to carry IPv6 traffic. And the result was that the network was more like a spaghetti plate than a real network, because it's very easy to create a tunnel. You just have to set 
to configure two routers and you have a tunnel. So you you have a room. You uh, for convenience you will create tunnel, but this tunnel will not be close to the physical topology of your network. So what appears for the routing protocol as a direct link, in fact, may include a lot of routers that are hidden by the fact that you are using a tunnel. And so you may have a very bad quality of service. So you have to take care about that when you create tunnels. And as a full mesh topology, may not be a good idea because you have a more maintenance because you have to configure everywhere and maybe you are not close to the network topology, the physical network topology. And so a direct link, in, pa in fact, may include a lot of routes. So you have to uh, take care of this and maybe another solution which may be easier to manage is, for example, to... So this topology is called mesh or full mesh. It means that you interconnect everybody with everybody. And here you have another solution which is called hub and spoke. So hub and spoke means that you are going to a central point and from this central point you are going to another point. So hub and spoke is because when you know why we call this uh, hub and spoke? In fact, when you look at the wheel the thing in the middle is a hub and all the wood that you have or in the bike all the metal here is a spoke. So hub is the central point and spoke is things that go are centralized on, on the hub. So hub and spoke here it doesn't look like this but the idea is the same is that you have a central point and uh, everything goes to your central point or leave your central point. So here it's easier to manage because when I add a new uh, yeah, a new element, I have to configure only this one, the central point, and the new element, and the other one will not have to be configured. Or, we will see in uh, here, no, very it's a way to do layer 3 VPN, and the management of this layer 3 VPN is done by the customer itself which create tunnels. Now, maybe you would like to have this thing managed by your provider. Because it's very boring to create tunnels, it, it leads to some administration, and say, okay, I delegate that to my provider. So, as a, just to answer to your question, so to create, create the tunnel, you can use IP over IP. So, for example, if you use protocol 4, you carry IPv4. So, you can have IPv6 either that carry IPv4, or IPv4 either that carry IPv4. You can have 41 to say that it's IPv6. You can use IPsec. So, this way you will see further information. Or you have some generic tunneling with a protocol called GRE or uh, L2TP. L2DP is a way to do point-to-point -point protocol on, on UDP. So you have a lot of ways to, to create the tunnel. This one is the simplest, but it's, uh, you have not a lot of functionality. It's just for IP. So, now what we are going to do is to do the same, but here, not from the company point of view, but directly in the ISP. And here, of course, it's more fun because we have to play with MPLS and all these things. <laughs> so we don't have to do with a stupid tunnel on your company network. So here you have PE, PEs that interconnect your provider. Of course, here we, you are very unlucky because you have two uh, competitors which have exactly the same addressing plan at each part of the, the network. Normally it's not so uh, synchronized, but 
Here is the worst case. And it's a worst case because you see here you have the same prefix here and here. So when you receive a packet, so 10.0.0.1, you have to make the distinction. You cannot say this packet, if you just look at the address, you don't know where to send it. So we have to, uh, to introduce new functionality we didn't have in the current internet. So one of them is what we will call virtual routing table. So instead of having only one routing table, remember what is a routing table? A routing table say when I want to reach that prefix, I use this next up. Unfortunately here, we have the same prefix. Okay, so this is not enough information. So what do I, what I will do in my router is, in fact, to create two fields. One for customer one and another one for customer two. And I will say, for example, this virtual routing table is used on that link to customer one, and this one is used on that link to customer two. And I will separate bo both of them, and it will be impossible to send traffic between these two. And here we have, when I want to send traffic to 10.0.1, I send it to my next stop. And here I will have another entry, 10.0.1. Dot zero dot one, I will send it to my next one, which can be a different address. So here I will create for each of my customer a routing table on my customer here will be able to populate this routing table using a routing protocol, but will not be able to populate the other routing table. And of course, you have the opposite for the other uh, Provider, uh, customer. So, that's good. So locally, because we are not using the same interface, I can separate the traffic from both of them. But that locally. If you remember, when we talk about VLAN, we have the same problem. It means that in VLAN, we can locally, on a switch, say this port belongs to the green VLAN, this port belongs to the red VLAN. And there was no problem, you cannot exchange information between VLANs. Here is the same thing. We do virtual, we separate, this interface go here and we put its own routing table, this interface go to another customer, we put its own virtual table. So we don't have now a virtual table for a machine, but we have a routing, sorry, we don't have a routing table for a machine, we have a routing table for a set of interfaces. So, we have done virtualization, but now we have to inform the other routers about my, what I have in my routing table. And here, if I look at the prefix, I have no way to make the distinction between these two prefixes. 10.0.1 are the same in both uh, in both networks. So I have to invent a new way to designate a company or this prefix. So I will add before the prefix a new element that I will call a root distinguisher. And the root distinguisher will be unique so different for the two customers. And this way, if I add the root distinguisher to the company prefix, there is no problem. I, I will make the distinction between both of them. So you have different ways to, to construct your root distinguisher. For example, one solution 
since for distinguisher I put it on eight bytes, is for example to put uh, autonomous system number of my customer and then a value for my customer. Or I can give, for example, a public address that I give to my customer and use it to distinguish between both customers. Or I can uh, use other things, for example, if my autonomous system is a new autonomous system number on 32 bit. But we don't go into details here. What I will do is, for example, we have a value v1 for this one and v2 for this one. It's internal convention of the ISP, so the ISP will select what he wants, and this way he can distinguish its customer inside network. And what we will do, and here that's why we call it NRI, network level, uh, network level reachability information, is because in the NRI we will have the prefix, so for example here 10.0.1 slash but that's not enough. We will add the root distinguisher and we will add also the MPLS level as we saw when we were doing 6P. So compared to 6P, remember we have IPv6 and a label. Here we will have a private address, but a private, a private prefix, but a private prefix is not enough, so we will have the unique value just before to make the distinction. So, now how it works, I use IPGP, as usual, to exchange what I know with other routers. So here, I use an address inside my company network. So here, it's a number I gave, an address I, I number, and if I have no luck, for example, it can be a private address, and I may use 10.0.1.1. It will be stupid. Oh, it will not be stupid, but it we will have everywhere 10.0.1. But it doesn't matter because here it will be on another routing table that will be for to manage prefixes inside my network. So my IGP will connect all the prefixes here, not the prefixes from the provider, so pref prefix from providers, for, for customers, sorry, are blocked here, so I will not inject them in my IGP. So it's like way with IPv4 or all the things we saw before. You never inject root inside your IGP, you just collect root that you have created here. So this way there is no confusion, between external root and internal root. So they can be in the same space using the same number. There is no confusion. So this way, with your IGP, you connect to connectivity, and then you make announcement. For example, here I am the red network. So red, in fact, is V1. It's the root distinguisher. I am the red network. So I have this wood extinguisher and I send you this information. So maybe this router is not interested, is not interested because he has no people in the red network. So he has no customer. So we will not, we will not take care about this information. But this other router has a red customer, so a wood distinguisher, for example, V1 here. So it will be interested by the information and take the prefix and the label you have to use to reach that prefix. So now, suppose that 10.0.4.1 wants to send a packet to 10.1.1, so the packet arrives to this router. This router knows that it's in the virtual table red, so look here, and you will learn that to, re to reach a prefix 10.0.1, you will have to send it to that next stop. So that next stop 
will be an IP address I can reach directly here. You look at your MPLS network to know the path to almost reach the, the network here, just the previous one. You send the packet with the stack of label. The label 60, which is given here for this prefix, and the label you have selected to join this router. So the packet will go here and will arrive to this router with the label 60. And 60, you know, is that for this prefix, and you will send it here. And of course, for the other router, for the other customer, we have also 10.0.1. So I say here, by putting the root distinguisher, that is my blue customer, but I give a different label. So since I give a different label, when a packet arrives here, if it's level 60, it will go here. If it's level 61, it will go here. And th it, since it's something I have decided inside my network, none of the customer can change the label. It's purely a vision in internal to my ISP network. And what they will say is just that they have MPLS. We may not see it, but they have just MPLS network in the middle, a link between them. So, this way, I have done isolation on my routing table here. So, I have, it's like having two routers. So, I have something virtual. And I'm making at BGP level isolation because I use separate distinguish, this root distinguisher. And at the MPLS level, I distribute different label names the different values, and so I cannot merge the circuit. So here, using these techniques, I have totally isolated gray, uh, orange and blue traffic. Okay? So, it's not finished. Because here I don't talk about the topology. When I was here, alone, managing my own tunnels or my own VPN, I was able to select if I, was, I wanted a full mesh or if I wanted a urban uh, architecture or even if I want, wanted something stranger. For example, let's say that I wanted a urban spot, but I wanted something here between three and four, a direct uh, communication, but not between two and four, for example because I know that I have a lot of traffic here and here I, I have to do So you can imagine all the uh, mesh top technology you, you need, not full mesh, that means that everywhere connected to every, everybody connected to everybody, but some intermediate things between full mesh and open stack. So, how you can do that? Then we are going to add a new uh, thing called root target. So root target is used to send, uh, to say if, when you receive something, if you accept it or not. So here, for example, when I'm sending my root in my attribute, I will add the root target. So here, for example, I put on all my, my announcement, accept one and export one. So it means that when I will send, I will put value one, and when I will receive, I will check if I will only accept things with value one. So okay. here I have put the same thing everywhere. So what does happen? It means that here I'm sending an IBGP message here with value one. This one will accept it because it accepts value one. I'm sending a BGP, IPGP message here with value 1. It will be accepted because it accepts value 1. This one is sending an IPGP message with value 1. It will be accepted everywhere because everybody accepts value 1. So it may look stupid, but this way, by selecting the same value as import and export, I create a full mesh 
on my network topology, my provider topology. Now, suppose that I do something more complex, and here I say import one, and on view over one I put export one. We mean that this one uh, will act, sorry, sorry, this is over export, so here this one will accept routing IPGP messages from the three over router. Now, if this one, for example, this one, I will say export two. So when I say export two and I send a message to this one, this one will, uh, sorry, if this one send a message to this one, okay, I'm saying export one. And this one accept only import two. Okay, here I've configured this line with export one. So this one will export to this one with export one, and it will be accepted because I have import one. But when I'm sending to this one with export one, here it will be refused because this one is expecting value two. So this way, what do you do? You create something that only this one accepts what the other are telling, and you are just sending, and you, all the other will accept you. So here you create a Hubbard Spock architecture because this one will be only aware about the prefix. So this is one possibility, and the last thing we have to do for that is what I said just before, we need a routing protocol. Because here, when I am a customer, I don't know the prefixes available on the network. So if I have open Spock, uh, sorry, full mesh, when I receive a prefix, I have different tunnels, and I have learned the different prefixes that were available on the different tunnels. So here, for example, I am in dot four, slash 24, and I'm sending something to dot one, slash 24. So I received from this router an announcement that he had this. But now if I am in the open spot, uh, open spot architecture, in the open spot architecture, I just talk with this one, and I know its prefix, but I don't know the prefix that is run on the over element. So what do I have to do? This one has to send the read message here to inform him about this prefix. This one will receive the read message and will know that he has to send to that one to reach this prefix. So it means that here we, could, we start to have some very funny things because we have a routing protocol in the IGP, in your provider network, sorry, to allow P to communicate together. And then, on, so this way we can create tunnel on the, our network. And then we are going now to run a routing protocol on this tunnel to allow our sites to communicate together. So you see, it's a little bit more complex. But when you will be in REN, you will have to do this, uh, this kind of uh, architecture on, uh, for the practical. 